so our current project is this if you if you stop and, and think back again is this amazing uh, project where we are running classic web languages HTML CSS JavaScript and with the magic of uh, deep down Cordova which we're using the version taco we are able to create a cross-platform app now we have been focusing on Android the whole time of course because just of its lower barrier to entry you know uh, getting one of these forty dollar moto E's at target is is great to to check the project or many of us came already with with an Android device so we can see our projects there and it is a cross-platform project which can run in an iPhone it can run in, it can run in an iPad on a Windows you know Windows 8 Windows 10 it can run on OS 10 and all of that we're focusing on at the moment the Android one because it's the lowest barrier to entry but we can still also publish it to the many platforms and I think it's really cool really amazing I've seen this over the years evolving so that it, this is viable this is something that we can do uh, and so we've been working on this project two and a half months now and uh, we're going to wrap up version one of the project today uh, and go through the process of creating a developer certificate building it as a final project we were working in a debug mode the whole you know the whole sequence now we're gonna work with a f with a real you know finished version then we're gonna talk about creating the developers portal to actually publish our app for free or for paid and then uh, in the last you know two weeks that we have left of the course we'll also be talking about version two we still have a lot that we can do with the app and one thing that I want to add to it is the ability to do some social sharing you know the kids love that you've got an app you're able to tweet from it or send you know an email from it or uh, you know I've got this data that I want to send off to someone else it's stuck in my app but I want to send it out to people I can share that that'll be some social sharing and email ability and such so that's what we're going to add for version 2 and maybe other things that we figure out. So I want to go through that whole sequence. You know, you can learn this stuff and, and learn Cordova and Taco and all of that and how to create a developer's account. But the whole, my three-month sequence, I try to touch upon all the aspects of the graphics of it, the code of it, the developer's account, the debugging of it and testing and beta testing and version 2 and so forth and republishing your app and all of that. So today's big idea then will be to do the final pre-flight check for our version 1 because I believe we're at MVP uh, minimum viable product. At the moment we've got a we've got an item we've got an app that works. We've got this project that has the various screens and transitions content of course the crowning piece is the database and uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, if you can run the project, or just watch what I'm doing, run the project in the browser quickly just to do a quick pre-flight about uh, what, what the project is. Because I want to look at it critically of what we've got, and then also start to build a, a to-do list of what we want to do for version 2. We might, already ha we might already have in mind that concept, but... Let me run the project again in the browser and then we'll talk about it. So basically the pre-flight is, you know, before we take off in an airplane, we need to make sure we've got all of our luggage and that the kids are in their seat and all of that. So we need to check that also for our project, that everything is as we expect to this point. I'm just going to load this up in the browser. And um, just taking a quick look at it, you know, content-wise, there's always more content that we can add. I'm just going to make a quick note here. Well, let me make a note on my notepad over here. To do for version 2.
as I browse the app a little bit, I see perhaps more content. Um, I'm going to write more dynamic content. Right now it's static content, isn't it? In that what we wrote in HTML stays in the project, doesn't change, it's not dynamic. Uh, the, the big dynamic aspect of the app, of course, is the database. But it would be nice to be able to have, for example, in the art calendar, for this to actually load up, you know, real content on a, on a regular basis, dynamically. Um, I would like to talk about, you know, more, more testing and more checking to see how our design looks upon, upon different platforms. In this simulator here of the Galaxy S5, supposedly then it cuts off my text a little bit on these buttons. But as I test it on other devices, uh, it may work fine, you know, if I take it over to the iPhone, less is visible, more is visible, etc. So, I'm going to make a note here, test more for responsive design, or set up more responsive design. The, the thing that we talked about uh, I think we touched upon it. We didn't actually do it. We might do it in version 2. We're not using any uh, custom icons. We're using all the icons that are built into, into, into Cordova. What about if we want to add our own icons? So that's a, a to-do that I could add there. Uh, custom icons for navbar. Again, I'm seeing stuff about content that's relatively easy to work with. Uh, over at the About screen, looks good, driving directions. For driving directions, perhaps, depending on the color scheme you chose, ours is all right, but I know for some of you that, that, that chose your own colors and such, um, some of the this text, for example, was starting to get hard to read. If you chose a dark background, this text right here was not changing. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say that that's something to work with because on some examples of, the, uh, of people's designs, that it needed that. So I'm going to go in to say uh, map screen uh, directions text color. more contrast. That's often something that happens that this color here doesn't change how you think it does. And that's just some CSS editing. But as is, our, our project works, works fine. We could work a little bit more on this customization. Remember, we tried to do a little bit about, well, what if you put nothing? What if you put uh, cancel? What do we do with these different types of input? You know, what if I'm putting in gibberish? It'll take that. That doesn't seem so good. So um, what I would say for that is um, that would be data verify data input for custom custom name. Remember a while ago we were playing with the concept about data input and we found a little bit of JavaScript snippet where uh, someone gave away some code about stripping away special characters so that it was only letters and numbers. We might look into that. And then the My Classes. So functionality wise, you know, all of this works. We could add some icons to these, maybe line, line up this, line this up a little bit better visually, because right now I've got each three of the buttons taking up its own space, which looks fine, but then as you start to save classes and show classes, that content gets pushed down. You've got all of this space being taken up by those buttons. What if we put the buttons in a three, 
you know, in a nice grid layout with three of them so that we free up a few precious pixels so that it doesn't get pushed down. So here I could say, um, for my classes, I have several things here perhaps. Uh, button or uh, redesign button inputs so that they line up better so that I put some icons you know if I put icons I might not, e might not even need text if I have the right icon I, I, I won't need the text that takes up the space it still isn't quite there that I'd like that lined up properly but again that depends on the device that it runs on over here on an iPhone this looks fine but it's still a lot of empty space on that so we have to figure out the CSS there a bit Tweak CSS for the table. Again, I'm mentioning all of these little things because, yes, we could still spend, you know, one more week getting all of this done. But we still have a lot to talk about, and it's a minimal viable product at the moment, isn't it? It works. It still has rough around the edges here and there, but I want to get through the whole process and release a version too. So you have to decide for yourself, do you want to get your app perfect, you know, when it's your app? Do you want to get it perfect, or do you want to get it out there? I'm not saying release a buggy item, a buggy app that doesn't, that doesn't even function the way it's supposed to. I'm just saying, how far can you go so that it's, it's ready to publish, so that then you can release a version 2 eventually? Tweak, edit, and delete. features. So those are some things that stand out for me. What about you guys? Do you guys have any opinions? What else uh, maybe has been bothering you about the app or what you'd like to do about it to further tweak it when we do version 2 and such? Yes? I'd like you to send an email. That's definitely. We'll be definitely doing that. So uh, send email and we're also going to say social sharing. So we will, we will definitely do, do those too. Anything else, anyone else uh, have any opinions on how else we can improve the app? It might come to you as we further work on it, but um, I think I've got, uh, we've got some ideas written down on our notes here um, about what to do for version 2. We'll get to that eventually. What I want to do now is uh, let's look at the folder of the project, the WW folder. Actually, before that, because we always forget this. Let's go to our project folder, and let's edit that config XML file. At this point, I would like that from now on, you're going to use your own version of the project. Uh, don't keep taking my version anymore because all of our versions that you took of mine have the exact same package ID. And therefore, if we go through the process of trying to upload this to Google Play or Amazon App Store or iTunes App Store, it'll reject yours because I've already uploaded mine with that unique ID or someone else beat me to it. So what I'm saying here is we need to go back and edit our config file to make it unique to you. So when we get to the point, and I would like for all of us to get to the point to actually upload a real app to the App Store. We can delete it, you know, we can unpublish it and all of that, but I would like to go through the whole process to create the App Store and the listing and upload it and make it for real, as I've shown examples of previous students. Let's uh, go to the config XML file, right-click, edit in Notepad. You need to change this uniquely for your own things. Line 2 is, is one of the important ones. I just put in here a package ID, com.kajiwara.mystc. You can put your last name, fake, anything you want. I'm going to keep the name mystce version 1.2016.03.10. I'm going to put that to today's date. This is optional, but I'll put today's date. 
and uh, and so um, this version number there, and then Android version code. This is one. <coughs> it's we're still going to keep that at one because the app stores <coughs> really most care about that version number there. Whatever you put under version, it'll say great, right? Whatever you want there. But version, Android version code, that has to be, you know, whole numbers that increment. You know, we've got version one that we'll submit to the App Store this week. Then uh, next week when we do version two, we're going to submit Android version code two. So it, it does need a whole number incremented every time we upload a version to the App Store. The name of the app, you can change that, you can leave it, put your last name. The description of the app is fine. Uh, author, so line five, author's email and website and such. Again, you can make that up. Or if you are going to do this for real, you can do that. This doesn't have to be real. We can make it up. We can do we can set all of this up and again the barrier to entry for Android is very low, which is great. We are able to create this project and actually upload it for real for to pay to be sold for pay, that is, or to be given away for free, all on our part for free when we get to that. So if you just make this all up fake for the learning process and then never go back and delete your app, that's fine. There'll be this, you know, phantom app out there in the App Store that no one claimed anymore. Uh, doesn't quite matter. And so that's all I really need to change here. Um, these details of the project. So I'm going to save that config file and close the config XML. Again, basically what to put there, you put something that makes sense for you so that your app is not exactly the same internally as mine. It will be rejected if you're trying to upload an app that has the same name of one that already exists. That's how we can have multiple calculator apps on the App Store all called Calculator. But internally, it's com.campos.calculator, com.smith.calculator, com.jones.calculator, etc. They've got that unique ID. Yes? Exactly. It's a reverse domain name. That's the format. It has to be some domain extension which can be .com, .net, .biz, .mx, whatever and then the main central part of the domain and then the last dot is your actual app name so it's all lowercase yeah exactly that that uh, can be different this is what the app stores look at that is unique but that doesn't have to be the same or it could be the same Let's look inside now of the www folder. And I'm just taking a quick look here. Uh, sometimes when we do these classes, we have files left over and such. I don't think we've got any at the moment, but taking a quick look, we've got the Kodika files. There's a necessary course, the index file, the jQueries, the map, and pouch. So there's no stragglers around there. Over on fonts, we've just got the necessary items, the actual fonts themselves, the style sheet, file, images, let's see, do we have anything on images that we might cut the fat with? Uh, just, I think there's one or, I think we're using all the pictures and throughout the app, so maybe one of those two. CE logo main and logo small, we might not be using one of them, but I think they're small, we don't really have to worry about it. 
but I'm, I'm saying this aspect of the pre-flight to, to do a look at your app again, like, did I leave a file in here that I was going to take out eventually? Oops, I left that 2 megapixel, you know, that 2 megabyte image in my project, which is going to take up space when I actually upload it to the App Store. My app might only be 1 megabyte in size, but I left a 2 megabyte picture in there, so now your app is huge because you've got that one picture as a straggler. I think all the things that we've got here we need and we use, and even if we don't, they're relatively small. So we should have that in mind to some degree when we were doing, if you were doing classic web design, you want to have, you know, the minimal files that you need, optimized, uh, compressed, and all of that, and we have that in our project. Those two icon folders there come with jQuery, so we'll leave those alone. Oh, wait a minute, Cordova, here, that one I guess we don't really need, we're not going to use that one at all. We're not using that graphic anywhere because we've got our own unique branding. So, what's the size on that one? 53K. It's not tiny, but it's not big. But I've got a copy of it saved elsewhere in case we need it, so I will delete that. I will delete Cordova.ping. We're not using it really anywhere in our project. It's kind of amateurish, I believe, to have it in there because we've evolved from the training wheels of Cordova. We've got our project. Back up. Let's see themes. What was themes about? Oh yes, theme was our was our colors and such. Uh, and that came basically out of the theme roller. Uh, technically, here our project is using mycolorsmen.css. It's not using mycolors, the uncompressed version. The uncompressed version would be necessary if we wanted to change our color scheme at some point, but in the scheme of our app it's not necessary and it's taking up uh, 26 kilobytes, not huge again, but it's still another resource that we that is part of our project that might take up some space. So I'm gonna delete it. I'm gonna delete my colors. Be careful, my colors, not my colors min. That's the one we're definitely using. The compressed version is min, the uncompressed version is my colors. I'm gonna delete the uncompressed version. That's what stood out to me. Anyone else? Uh, you see anything in there that maybe we do or don't need? For the uh, tablet, so the image um, looks like more square, so we can cut different sides. That's going to be regarding when the note over here about the um, uh, res a more responsive design. Because it may be true that on a tablet, because you've got a larger screen to work with, things might not line up as much as you want. So that can be worked with. One of the cool things that we can do with, with, with uh, jQuery Mobile is there's a little section in there about responsive design that when you've got a larger tablet, you will create a side menu so that it's not empty. So that might be something to do on version 2, to focus more on it. tablet sizes. Alright, so let's, uh, let's open this CSS file, kodika.external.css. Let's open that in Notepad. Taking a quick look at my code. So, uh, I see on line 49 I wrote some commented code for some reason. Uh, that's just, I guess, another way to say the same color. So you have to decide what you want to do with your comments. I'm going to look at the, the various f code files, and if there are comments, you can choose to leave them or remove them. Usually we're going to leave comments that are, you know, that are much more explanatory. This was sort of like me playing with colors and concepts. For myself, I don't think that has any value, so I'm going to remove line 49. Save myself a few bytes there. Delete a few empty spaces at the very end to get it to line 72. It's a bit optional. Line 31, uh, this was something myself that I was playing with that I forgot to mention in class, but now that I see it, it reminds me. 
we have a little bit of CSS here that if you want to flip an image, you know, if I took a photo of something and I actually wanted the reverse of it, with this CSS I can transform it along the X axis to, to flip it. So that's kind of useful if I've got some sort of graphic that I want to reuse throughout my project but reversed. I didn't use it anywhere in my project, so I'll delete that line. I have a copy of the code elsewhere, but that's the code to flip an image. Obviously, if you wanted to rotate it the other direction, scale Y, capital Y, negative 1, and that'll flip it vertically. So I'm going to remove line 31. There's these comments up on the top. I, I like these. These uh, kind of are explanatory. Uh, so I'm going to leave those, but I don't need line one. Put your custom CSS. We know what this whole file is about by now, hopefully. So I'm going to remove line one completely just to free up a little bit. But what I will do uh, is something that I like to add a little bit uh, for the branding of the project. In case you use something like GitHub or you share your code, you send it to people. I like to put a little bit of branding in this in, in my code. I'm happy to share the code, but I, you know, getting a little bit of, of a credit for it is all I ask for. So I'm going to say, I'm going to do this, which is optional. I'm going to go to the very end of my document and give myself a little multi-line uh, comment block over here where I'm going to write project, or I'm going to write pro project author, project name, version, date, description. I won't spend too much on this, but you, you, get, the, you get the idea what this is, isn't, don't you? This is a little bit of a, you know, branding that I'm the developer of this project if you use my code. Uh, but, you know, give me some credit, maybe. And you can fill that out however you want. I'm going to put a, a, a version of this in all the files, actually, because it may be that for some reason this CSS file travels to someone that wanted this code and they have no reference of where it came from. Same thing with the JavaScript, same thing with the HTML. So I'll put a version of this, basically copy and paste to all the other files. So because it is a comment, you can, you can get a little fun and creative right here and just put some... ASCII art. So this block of code here, I'm going to use it also for the JavaScript, so I'm going to copy that. And I'll do the same thing over on the JavaScript file. Here we've got about 78 lines of code of CSS, you know, a few tweaks, a few design tweaks of the project and such. And I'm going to go do a, a sort of once-over look over to the JavaScript file as well, but any questions on the CSS file at this point? Um, you could of course go in and give yourself comments about what each of these does, but hopefully we named these good enough so that they make sense. A div, right column, a div, left column, div, two column, class table. Hopefully we name these things, you know, creatively enough that they make sense on their own. I'm going to save the CSS file and I will then open the Codica ext.js file. And I'm going to copy that comment block right there. Let's open the JS file. I'm going to paste it at the very end. So just same code or same bit of branding.
I'm going to remove the very first line because put your custom code here. Yes, of course. So I'm going to remove that. Got a few comments. Do something here, maybe. Yep, we'll do something there in version two, maybe. Uh, to do Cordova has been loaded, performing initialization. Okay, I see here line 25. That was something we were playing with a while ago. That was just like our very first look at. Uh, Oh, that's the, uh, oh yes, that's the plain old JavaScript version of the next line. I'm going to remove line 25 completely. I'm going to remove that comment document dot get element by ID. Just remove that. Uh, line 24. Um, that's kind of redundant nowadays. That was back at the beginning when we were learning the importance of the on device ready. We know now that basically all of our code is going to exist or most of the code is going to exist on on device ready so this about Cordova has been loaded performing initialization that's kind of redundant now so I'm going to cut out that comment but I will leave the comment about handle the pause and resume events uh, maybe for version 2 I want to eventually work about work with something about what if I what if I close the app temporarily switch apps and such to come back to it I'm going to be able to handle those events Message callback title, do something on alert dismissed, prompt. There's a whole commented item. What's this one? Notification prompt. So you guys remind me, what was this one about? Notifi navigator notification prompt. Please enter your name. Um, I guess it's still just I don't know, some testing thing because it still says Jane Doe. I don't know. The app works, and it's commented, so we probably won't have trouble removing it. Uh, so no one remembers what that code did. The only first time you can run it, you run it after the name, and that way when the app runs, it's personalized a little bit. Oh, okay, yes. It was that auto asking for the name. Yes. Okay, yes, obviously, because it's not inside of a function, it would run by itself. Okay, yeah. So we have a, a version of that elsewhere, and that was that was asking us right away for the person's name. Uh, we don't want that. We want it to be asked once they click. So I'll remove that whole block. But you can keep it if you'd like. Make yourself a comment what it is. But I'll remove it. Line 65, I'm going to remove that. That's using the plain old variable, whereas then we have really to use local storage to be more permanent for the person's name, so that is redundant. Uh, maybe that console log of clicked, we know that get name works. So I'm going to take that out. Oh, we do have on line 71 that code that strips out non-alphabetic characters. And pouch starts on 84 and goes off for about 100 lines. Um, I see line 111, that was a way to reset the form, but the, the, that one didn't work because we were trying to mix jQuery and JavaScript, I believe. So line 112 works. I will remove that vestigial line, form class dot reset. Again, if you don't remove any of this, the project will still work just fine. This is all to some degree personal about if you'd like to do this or not. If you'd like to clean up the code, give yourself comments, you know, we did it together and we made it look so easy in class, but then when you do it yourself, you might have trouble here and there, so give yourself comments. What did this do? Because eventually when you, you know, pass this class, go past this class and you want to do it yourself, all the code is here. How did it actually work? Well, if you give yourself comments, that might help, you know, get, get it clicking in your mind so that it can fully, you can fully do it when you need to when, when I'm not around. Then we've got those functions of pause and resume. We'll do something with them eventually, so I'll leave those alone. And then my comment down at the bottom. So that comes down to 200 lines.
What's that? Line one. Yes, I also took out line one at the very top. And I ended up with about 200 lines. If you have more or less, it doesn't quite matter, but I went through that and kind of cleaned it up a bit. And I know we've got a bunch of just uh, just to conf just to check myself. I want to check how many console logs we've got. Count fourteen of them. So we might decide to leave those alone or take them out for beta testing. Maybe comment them out or delete them. I don't know. There's fourteen of them. I'm just going to um, I'm going to leave them. Or I suppose what we could do is we could do the handy find and replace. We could do this. We could do console log. Now, uh, this might be a little blind, but what I could do is that. Wherever there's an instance of console.log, comment out that one line. I'm doing a double comment. I don't know if I want to do that blindly for 14 lines, but, you know, that, that'll just simply deactivate wherever we've got console output, such as, you know, Cordova's ready, click button, all of that. I won't do it, because even on that, I'm not, I wouldn't quite trust myself. I would check it. What do those lines do? But I'm just showing you here that this find and replace could be very useful, very cool, because you can change one line of code into another line. And here I'm reasoning that I can comment, I can do a single line comment probably to the console.log, but I won't. <coughs> Cancel that. I think overall the JS file is ready to go, perhaps. Any questions or comments on the JS file? I Oh, take photo. Yeah, good point. We still have that uh, ability to take a photo. It's just not active anywhere. Thinking about it in terms of this app, taking a photo might not be that useful. We have the code saved elsewhere. This chunk of code here is pretty self-contained. So that's a good point. I'm going to remove that. You can comment it out. But since really this is very vestigial for our project, I'm, I'm going to remove that. So on mine, it's, it's from about line 46 to 52. You've got when the Take Photo button is clicked, take a photo. You've got to take the photo here. On success, on fail. That's right, because we've got uh, the callback of get picture on success and on fail. Yes, so actually then from about 46 to 61, there's the take a photo get take photo, successfully take a photo, failure to take a photo. So at about 46 to 61, get take photo, unsuccess, and on fail. We'll take all of those out. Just make a comment. In the book that you recommended, I was just reading that you said that there's so many different Android devices now, different hardware situations with different cameras that may just be better to take. Possibly. Uh, what I would do, if I, if, especially if I need it for my project, I would try to read up as much as possible. What are the pitfalls? What are the caveats? Over at cordova.apache.org, there's a section about Android quirks. There's a section about iPhone quirks. And it tries to tell us, if you're going to use the camera on an Android, here's some possibilities to think about. So it is a good point. You have to decide. Maybe don't add a feature that might not be fully supported or maybe deactivate a feature for certain devices, or look at those quirks and see how to work with them. So there's lots of ways to address that. All right, so I'm going to save that JS file, and we'll move on to the next file. Uh, I, I want to look at the map file. The index file is is, is uh, three times larger, so I'm going to look at the map file first. Remember, map shows 
that whole Google map and directions and such. So let's open map.html. One of the first things that pops up over here is something that um, you know we didn't really talk too much about. It's it's line five. When you create a brand new taco project, it adds this line, this meta tag, the CSP, Content Security Policy. And this is supposed to help make your app more secure, especially if you're going to create a project that is going to be web-based. If you're creating a mobile-friendly web project and you're putting it up on a server, the CSP line here is supposed to help your project be more secure because conceivably if you are loading resources from some other server we're loading all of these local files however we are loading in this file a remote a couple of remote resources lines 38 and 42 for example the CSP is supposed to help you avoid possible hacks on your app because someone could hijack the connection over to that server conceivably. And in the middle, what they put is their own JavaScript file with whatever you know evil things are in that, and then your app is compromised. And someone wrote some JavaScript to capture all of those credit card numbers and send them off to their own server. So the CSP line at the top is supposed to help prevent that in that it's very strict about what can this project access. We're not going to talk a lot about it at the moment, but if you go to contentsecuritypolicy.com, you know, spelled exactly like that, content-security-policy.com. If you go to that site at some point, there'll be the whole the whole, you know, schematic of this to help make your your project more secure. For us in this file, I'm have it deactivated because we do need to talk more in detail about whitelisting online resources and such. Uh, this is saying, for example, we can access self, so data or resources in the project. We can access things that have a, a URL scheme of data. We can access those that have gap, and those that have, and things that are at this website. Uh, and other things. The point of this is that if we activate this line, if we take away the comment and try to run this file, it won't work because we have to tell it also allow access to googleapis.com and maps.google.com and these and these these APIs, these, this JavaScript is also accessing other things throughout the Google ecosystem. And we'd have to then say, allow this website, and allow that website, and allow this, and allow that. So for the moment, because our project is not going to be a web project, I'm OK with deactivating that CSP. But if we were running this off a real web server, we would want to take the time to craft this whitelist to allow it to properly function to help us prevent uh, cross-server attacks. Yes? There's an in-app purchase that we create within our app. Um, are we responsible for the security of credit card information that comes through, or is that ignored by the whatever we store? That's a good point. I don't have the best answer at the moment, but the purchasing actually happens through uh, through the Google through the Google code. Um, I don't have the best answer right now to give you. Um, but I know, like, for example, over in my web class, when we do the e-commerce class, in there, things are being uh, handled through PayPal, and therefore PayPal has the, uh, has the onus of security. For us right here, I'm not exactly sure, so I'd have to further look it up. So I'm going to keep line 5 there, because eventually I might want to use it. The rest of the code... Uh, the way it relates is that you've got to um, you've got to to line five. You've got notice there's a link there. 
ssl.gstatic.com. You've basically got to add the other websites listed on 38 and 42. You've got to add Ajax at Google APIs as well as Maps at Google APIs. And as you further test it, it's going to say, well, Google was trying to access googlefonts.com, and we don't have that listed in the whitelist. So basically, it's like a little bit of cat and mouse about uh, what are the safe sites that we can use in our app. So for the moment, we'll just say, let, let us use any, any sites. We'll worry about that later if we were going to put this as a web project. We've got that block of 38 to 42. Um, what we could do here, thinking about it, the way this works is we needed jQuery 1.7.2. We could go to jQuery.com and download that file and put it as, a, as an internal, as an offline resource. But this is going to reference Google Maps anyway, and we can't download that library. It's going to be referencing the online API anyway. So if you wanted to, you could download the jQuery 172 file to keep it internal, but I'm going to leave it as is. That Maps stuff, that was all good. Do you remember a while ago at about line 110, there was here that you would get a pop-up for every step of the way. An alert would pop up for every step of the way. Um, I don't know, we might implement that at some point. So you can decide to leave that or not. And then line 130, that's the line that had the link to the original concept of this map. You may want to go back to it to reference it, um, to give credit to it and such. For myself, because, and it to some degree doesn't even matter, but to myself, I want to save every, every byte necessary if, if it's not necessary. So I'm going to remove it. You don't have to, but I'm going to remove that link to Stack Overflow, and I'm going to remove that because I know myself, I'm never going to get to that. I've got other things to worry about. So I'm never going to get to it. You might. So you can leave it if you'd like, but I'm going to take out that little chunk there about showing you step by step. That's not quite the point of my app. It's not a, it's not a GPS navigation app that I want to show people, now turn left, now turn right, now go 100 miles. You know, I just want to show a map, general directions, and that's it. Remove that whole part. That saves a few precious bytes. And I want to add the block at the bottom of the comment, although be careful here because this is a JavaScript comment block and we're no longer in JavaScript. I'm going to add this at the very end. <coughs> It's got to be an HTML comment. And that reminds me, are we able to add HTML comments outside of the HTML tag? Technically? Maybe? I guess not, because we're out of the HTML scope, so we shouldn't add it there. So just to be safe, I'm going to put it before the final HTML. We can put it in the script section, sure, because it'll be it'll then be JavaScript. Put a script tag within the HTML or no? At that point. Yeah, we could do that too. I in my case I did change it to plain old HTML comments, but sure, I can leave it as I can leave it as JavaScript comments and then put a couple of script tags just for the comment, sure. But remember, I'm trying to save all those bytes. I'm going to put it down there. Uh, remember here, do if you do it the way I did it, make sure you put these as HTML comments, not JavaScript comments. If they don't turn green, they're not HTML comments. They should be green.
All right, any questions on this map file before we go over to the index? Necessary on each. No, because it's because it's a comment block. It doesn't care that they're there. I just put them there because I like how they look. Or I could do do it like this, maybe just for fun. That's all valid because the comment starts here, ends here, and then that's comment block. I see some really fancy things there uh, for comments. Have you ever been curious and looked at the comments of websites? Um, let me see if I can pull it up here very briefly. This is a tangent, but if I can pull it up, this would be nice. I know that, that one of the Mozilla homepages, um, here maybe. One of the Mozilla home pages, if you look at their comment, they've got, uh, no, not this one. Anyway, on one of them, if you go look at one of the Mozilla uh, home pages, you look at their code, there's actually a little Mozilla dragon drawn there in ASCII code. So that's for people that are have no time on their hands and they just want to look at code. But anyway, that's the lost art of ASCII art. I'm going to go over to the index file now and do something similar. All right, so my index file. I think overall on this one, okay, I do see something here, line 65. Okay, that was when we were playing with YouTube buttons and making the button beep and the camera, which reminds me, BTN feedback. Hmm, did we leave BTN feedback over at the JavaScript file? That was just our little test to make something beep uh, when we were playing with beep. BTN feedback. Yeah, we still have that, actually. But anyway, on the index file at about line 65, we've got a link to YouTube, which we're not using anymore, BTN feedback to make it beep. There's the take photo, and there's display photo. So that whole chunk 65 to 68, I will delete that. Line 252 or so in the About section, we had this image placeholder, which we stopped using a long time ago. So I'm going to remove line 252, 253. <coughs> that was a placeholder for an image out of on googleapis.com. Oh wait, no, that was okay. That was to display a static map of San Diego. If we wanted to display one simple graphic of a of a map location, that's that. But then we've got our version, which is better. It's dynamic. So I'm going to cut that part out. And then it ends, and I will paste in that comment again at the bottom before the, the end of HTML. If we go back one more time to the JavaScript file, I, I was reminded of this looking at the HTML. This is some stuff that's left over from a while ago at about line 29 to 44. A while ago when we were learning about feedback 
there it is about, remember that very noisy day that everyone figured out how to make their phone beep? <laughs> That's that right there. So if you'd like to keep that, you can, but it's not attached to any button at the moment. Line 29, it's saying BTN feedback, which we just deleted on the HTML, which would run get feedback, which has the, the beep, and it has a pop-up alert. And you see then there's a callback of alert dismissed, which runs there, which says nothing at the moment. The on prompt, which is another proof of concept. If you click the particular button, it would say you clicked on the button number two. That's not being used anywhere. So you can leave that if you'd like, but I'm going to take it out. It's at about line 29 to 44. And so I think uh, overall we've gone through our project and uh, that was our pre-flight, and there might be some couple things here and there that are left over. Uh, we're going to take our first break, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one final uh, build of this project. Go ahead and run Taco Build. So we have the latest version of it. We'll take a break, and I'll turn the printer back on. And then we're going to do what's in instruction number eight uh, together. So I'm going to load up my... load command prompt and I'll do taco build. I'll let that run. It's about 710. We'll be back at 720. And then we'll do the, uh, the process of creating a developer certificate and building a final version of our project. Right now we're in debug mode. We want to build a release version and then what all that entails. So we'll be back at 720.